On April 3, 2011, the budding television network AMC debuted its newest scripted television series, The Killing, a serial crime drama that promised to stand out amongst the crop by devoting an entire season to a single murder. Produced by 21st Century Television, the acclaimed pilot episode introduced us straight away to the senseless killing of a young high school student and the ripples that her death creates in the big city of Seattle, Washington. Serving as this ship's captain is showrunner Vina Sood, who brings with her not just years of experience from shows such as Cold Case, but as well as an arsenal of talented cinematographers, editors, actors, and writers to create a dark, brooding series that dares to give us a peek at the brutal, nihilistic truth of crime in the 21st century. At the center of the series are homicide detective Sarah Linden, played by the subtle but supremely talented Murray Enos, and Stephen Holder, played by the sultry, nuanced Joel Kinnaman, both deeply affected by not only the horrific crimes they investigate, but by a lifetime of traumas of their own. The Killing is a U.S. adaptation of the Danish crime drama For Bedelsen, which translated to The Crime was also broadcast in the United Kingdom as The Killing. Production on the series began just as the original series was beginning work on its third and final series. The Danish version had just debuted in the UK where it was well received and highly popular among viewers, therefore building hype and anticipation for the American adaptation. The first trailer for The Killing debuted during the season 1 finale of the television series The Walking Dead, itself an adaptation of a popular comic book series and had served as AMC's first true breakout hit. The production team was based primarily in Vancouver, Canada, which is a frequent stand-in for Seattle and other large American cities due to its size and low costs in filming there. Casting consisted of an even mix of American and international talent. Marie Enos, who had just gained recognition from her work on the television series Big Love, was cast as lead detective Sarah Linden, a role that she has since become well-renowned for. Swedish actor and relative newcomer Joel Kinnanen was cast opposite Enos as Detective Stephen Holder. Both Enos and Kinnaman have gone on to appear in several major Hollywood productions, as well as many other television series. Esteemed character actress Michelle Forbes was cast as the grieving mother of Rosie Larson, Mitch, with her husband and Rosie's father being played by Brandon Sexton. Rounding out the cast is Billy Campbell, famous for his role in Disney's The Rocketeer, who portrays Seattle City Councilman Darren Richmond, an earnest do-gooder whose campaign for city mayor unfortunately gets wrapped up in the Larson investigation. Alongside him are his assistants Gwen and Jamie, played by Kristen Lehman and Eric Layden, respectively. Production on the pilot episode commenced in 2010, with filming of the rest of the season completing just shortly before the show's premiere in April 2011. Famed director Patty Jenkins, who has gone on to direct the Wonder Woman series, directed the pilot and received many award nominations for her work. I remember watching the first trailer for the series and becoming instantly hooked. My brother and I watched the premiere together, and, and while he lost interest quickly when he found out it would be a long time before the killer was revealed, I for one was entranced. The two hour long pilot was so engrossing it seemed to breeze by in only minutes. Following an encore airing right afterwards, it was pretty safe to say that I was hooked. The Killing became the first show that I would watch religiously, making sure not to miss a single episode each Sunday even though I would have to wake up early for school the next day. In addition, the show was also the first show where I began paying attention to the ratings and reviews, although this would mostly be for the second season onward. For me, the two standout performers were Marae Enos and Michelle Forbes. Forbes in particular broke my heart in several episodes, showcasing the grief over the loss of her only daughter in ways that I had never seen on television or film. She was a revelation, and her standout moment for me was in the fourth episode, A Soundless Echo, in which she rejects a priest's lethargic words of comfort in a moment of anger and resentment. The series begins with a frightful chase through the woods, intercut with our first introduction to Sarah Linden, who is seen running through the woods as well on a morning jog, while our would-be victim, Rosie Larson, is relentlessly chased by her mysterious assailant. This is the first of many examples of cross-cutting, an editing technique that the series would later go on to use to greater effect. Sarah, who is preparing to move to California with her teenage son and fiancé Rick, is called to the scene of a potential crime on her last day on the force. Along for the ride is Sarah's replacement, Stephen Holder, recently transferred from narcotics. Although the two at first seem like an unlikely pair, their casual yet sarcastic back-and-forth banter quickly warms them both up to each other. 
Evidence at the scene leads the detectives to the Larson family, who have just come back from a weekend camping trip. At first nothing seems amiss until Sarah inquires about the Larson's daughter Rosie, which causes the family to realize that nobody has heard from her since the week before. Rosie, who had told her family she was staying with a friend, is soon reported missing, and word begins to spread fast at Rosie's school and throughout the city of Seattle. Elsewhere, City Councilman Darren Richmond and his team are preparing for the final stages of a heated race for mayor against current mayor Leslie Adams. As the detectives continue to search for Rosie, both campaigns begin plotting to use Rosie's disappearance for their own benefits. At the same time, Rosie's parents and Aunt Terry frantically search for Rosie, coming up empty when confronting Rosie's friend Sterling and ex-boyfriend Jasper Ames, both of whom deny knowing Rosie's whereabouts. As the first day draws to a close, more evidence uncovered in the woods leads the police to a lake, which upon searching recover a submerged car. Inside the trunk, the detectives find Rosie's body, confirming the worst possible outcome for the Larson family. Tragically, Rosie's father accidentally stumbles upon the crime scene while out driving for Rosie. In the first of many twist endings for the series, the pilot ends with the revelation that the car Rosie was found in belongs to Darren Richmond's mayoral campaign. Episode 2, which aired alongside the pilot, covers the second day of the investigation as well as the impact Rosie's death has on her inner circle and the mayoral campaigns. This 24 hour per episode formula would carry on for each subsequent episode until the end of season 2. Rosie's parents identify her body and are questioned by the police for the first time, as is Darren Richmond's team, who are eager to get ahead of a potential PR nightmare and address the press, but are kept from doing so by Sarah. Rosie's two younger brothers are told of Rosie's death after being kept in the dark for most of the episode, and the scene of the family breaking down at the beach is one of the most haunting and emotional scenes I've ever seen on television. Sarah and Holder slowly begin to uncover details about Rosie's last hours alive, and it becomes apparent that Rosie held many secrets and mysteries from her loved ones and friends. Sarah resists the case at first, wanting to put the past behind her and move on. But political pressure, as well as her growing curiosity, begin to put a strain on her relationship with Rick. The episode ends with Sarah missing her flight and visiting the newest crime scene, her resolve to catch Rosie's killer now all but cemented. The series premiere received universal acclaim from critics and audiences alike, debuting with 2.7 million viewers and over 4 million total including delay viewings and encores. At the time, this was AMC's second highest rated premiere ever, only bested by The Walking Dead. The show's absorbing atmosphere, music, production design, and acting performances were singled out by almost every reviewer, and many were quick to call the show AMC's next breakout series. It also was the recipient of six Emmy nominations, as well as a Golden Globe nomination for Murray Enos. The show was also nominated for four Saturn Awards, including a win for Michelle Forbes for Best Supporting Actress. As the season continues, we continue to get hints and clues about Rosie's last months alive, as well as the gradual deterioration of both Darren's mayoral campaign and Sarah's personal life. Her upcoming nuptials to Rick are jeopardized, who questions her dedication to the case. Her relationships with her son Jack and longtime social worker Reggie Darnell are also strained. Holder's past history with drug use also comes to light, but the duo's mutual respect and work ethic draw them close together in the pursuit of Rosie's killer. The Larson family deals with the loss of Rosie in their own ways, sometimes resulting in more chaos and destruction, and Stan Larson's background with the local mob surfaces as a possible lead in Rosie's death. I didn't keep up too much on what the conversation was like around the show during the first season. I only knew that I loved the show and it seemed to have good buzz. For the most part, I enjoyed the entire first season and was engrossed by the mystery and haunting portrayal of grief all throughout. It's a truly tragic and senseless crime, and I'm sure it rings true to many unfortunate souls out there, unlucky enough to be grieving the loss of a loved one. For the second season renewal, I remember looking forward to what new case Sarah and Holder would be investigating next. Little did I know that the online discourse surrounding the series was beginning to shift, and not in a good way. While I personally do not share these criticisms, several critics and many viewers were becoming bored with the prolonged investigation and even annoyed by the show's cliffhanger endings and use of red herrings as a means of creating potential suspects. I can understand why this may have been off-putting to some people, but this often rings true in real-life homicide investigations, which can have many dead ends and take years to solve. The show's ratings also reflected this train of thought, gradually losing viewers throughout the first season, dropping below 2 million for much of the later half. 
The 11th episode of the season, titled Missing, was considered to be a standout by all critics and fans. It follows Sarah and Holder as they put the investigation on hold to look for Sarah's missing son, Jack. We learn a great deal of information about both parties' backstories, with Sarah having been in foster care for much of her childhood and struggling to give Jack the life she always imagined, while Holder seeks to atone for past mistakes made during his time as a drug addict. The episode was notable for featuring only Sarah and Holder from the main cast, with the mayoral and family plot lines being absent for the entire runtime. In this episode, we also begin to learn about a mysterious case from Sarah's past, offhandedly referred to by several people in Sarah's life from previous episodes. She laments over a little boy whose father killed his mother and how he will never have a true family. As the season draws to a close, Sarah and Holder uncover evidence that Rosie was making secret trips to an island Indian casino outside of the city, and appeared to be associated with an online escort service that Rosie's aunt Terry also happens to work for. Terry happens to be dating Jasper's father, Michael Ames, who has coldly rebuked her in the aftermath of Rosie's murder. All of this leads back to a mysterious figure named Orpheus, a client of the escort website who was known to talk about what it would be like to drown. In the penultimate episode of Season 1, this figure is revealed to be none other than Darren Richmond himself. By the Season 1 finale, Darren's campaign had managed to pull off an incredible comeback after it had initially seemed doomed by the investigation. When Sarah confronts Darren about the Orpheus account, now convinced that Darren is responsible, Darren rebuffs her and denies killing Rosie. In the first of several callbacks to the pilot episode, the detective searched the woods one last time after tracing her steps back to the same park her body was found in. Gwen, who had been in a personal relationship with Darren, begins to have second thoughts about Darren's innocence, and turns over evidence that Darren had met Rosie before after discovering the Orpheus connection. When Holder produces a security camera photo of Darren in the car Rosie's body was found in, it appears to be a very open and shut case. Sarah and Holder swiftly arrest Darren and the case wraps up. Rosie's mother, Mitch, despondent over her daughter's death, leaves the family to have some time for herself. As Sarah boards her plane with Jack and Toe to begin their new lives in California, Sarah is informed that the security camera that took the photo was broken on the night of the murder, and therefore the photo cannot have been real. Just as Darren is placed into a squad car, Belko Royce, a family friend of the Larsons who had become unhinged throughout the season, pulls a gun on Darren as the episode closes. The season 1 finale was met with harsh reviews and backlash from many audiences, destroying the goodwill that the show had built up to that point. Many had felt that the show had made an implicit promise to reveal Rosie Larson's killer by the end of the season, and therefore felt betrayed or outraged that it would be another year before they would know. To make matters worse, Venus Sood seemed to imply that the mystery would be resolved pretty quickly in Season 2 before a new case would emerge, only for her to backpedal and reveal it would not be until the end of Season 2 that this would be revealed. This was not acceptable to many viewers and critics, and some swore off the show for good. My issue with this criticism is that the marketing for the show never made this promise, and in fact the only thing that was promised by the Season 1 finale was that we would be talking about it all summer, which was certainly true. Moreover, the original for Bedelson series split up the first season into two parts, airing the first 10 episodes before ending with a cliffhanger very similar to the season 1 finale of The Killing. The series then resumed the remaining 10 episodes several months later. While I myself was at first outraged by the cliffhanger, I had already come to love the show so much that I wasn't about to quit right then and there. I was in this for the long haul, and so I would spend the next year eagerly awaiting the season 2 premiere. Season 2 of The Killing aired one year later in the spring of 2012, with all main cast members returning. In the lead up to the season premiere, there was much speculation about the show's ratings and if the show could rebound after such a harsh reception to the season 1 finale. The conversations surrounding the show had changed so drastically since the acclaimed pilot, and many were ready for the show to be over. The hashtag you the killing became a trending topic on review sites, and hate watching became the new norm. Even fans of AMC's other shows took it upon themselves to join in on the bashing of the killing. Its Sunday night air date was also shared with Game of Thrones, itself a burgeoning phenomenon at the time, and so its success was often compared to the killing. When the season premiere finally aired, many questions were answered almost immediately. Darren Richmond had indeed been shot by Belko and was rushed to the hospital, where it was later revealed that he's been paralyzed from the waist down. 
Holder, who was assumed to have been in league with the conspiracy against Richmond, is shown to actually be an unwitting pawn in winning the election for Mayor Adams, and thus did not know that the photo he turned in was a fake. Sarah and Jack abandon their plans for California permanently as Sarah goes rogue, with her increasingly brash behavior driving a wedge between her and the police force. Rosie's family also deals with Mitch's absence as Terry continues to spiral in the wake of her failed relationship with Michael Ames. Season 2 of The Killing was a mostly satisfying experience for me, though I will concede that stretching the case on for two seasons was probably a mistake. This was reflected in the rating, which fell by more than a third in the season 2 premiere, and they never recovered, although viewership did stabilize for the remainder of its run, settling for an average in the mid-1 million range. This drop in ratings was highly reported by media outlets as a sign that the show had flopped or was in danger of being cancelled. Critically, the reception was more muted than it had been before, but was still predominantly positive. Some critics were willing to give the show a second chance, while others were outright refused to review episodes due to feeling burned by the season 1 finale. It's really impossible to state just how much damage that season 1 finale did to this show's reputation, and it hung over the series for many years after. Throughout the season, as Sarah and Holder find themselves further isolated from the police force and their loved ones, the duo uncovers evidence that someone in Richmond's campaign was working with the Indians to broker a deal between the two and sabotage Mayor Adams in return. Michael Ames is revealed to have been a part of this deal as well, owning a construction company that would help construct a new casino operated by the Indians within the city. As the detectives get closer, the Indians hit back hard, first kidnapping and almost killing Holder, then assaulting Sarah and having her placed in a psychiatric ward against her will when she gets too close. Sarah almost loses custody of Jack and sends him off to live in Chicago with his estranged father's new family. All of this boils over when Sarah crosses one too many people and is ousted from the police force, forcing her and Holder to operate independently. Mitch Larson, in a storyline that takes up most of the season, travels the back roads of Washington State while confronting demons of her past. Michelle Forbes was a highlight of season 1 for me, so keeping her away from the main action and not featuring her at all for episodes at the time just seemed like an odd miscalculation on the writer's part. Indeed, this was probably my least favorite part of the season, and when Mitch finally rejoined the Larson family, I was elated. The standout episode for me this season was without a doubt 72 hours, the aforementioned episode when Sarah is placed under an involuntary suicide watch. During this episode, Holder tries his best to follow up on leads for Sarah while simultaneously trying to find a way to get her out. But the most riveting drama occurs within the hospital, when Sarah is unable to run away from her troubles any longer and is forced for the first time in her life to directly confront her past. A session with the hospital psychiatrist unearths a wealth of information about Sarah's own childhood, as well as a more in-depth explanation of this mysterious case that Sarah seems to be obsessed with. Throughout the series, we've been given glimpses of a drawing done by the child whose mother was supposedly murdered by his father. But Sarah noticed irregularities in the evidence, and eventually came to believe that the father was innocent and that the killer was never brought to justice. This cryptic drawing the kid made later became a symbol of her obsession. Of course, in typical Linden fashion, Sarah is released right before she's about to make a breakthrough in discussing her trauma from being abandoned by her mother as a child, choosing to leave rather than confront the painful past any longer. Though this would not be the last time we would hear from both the past case and Sarah's own childhood. The investigation, mayoral campaign, and Rosie's grieving family all come together in the season 2 finale, which featured returning director Patty Jenkins at the helm. From recovered video footage taken at the casino night of Rosie's death, the detectives learned that Rosie was working as a maid in the casino and had visited the top floor to take one last look at the city she loved. Rosie had grown bored of her life in the big city and was eager to escape into the world on her own. But fate unfortunately would have different plans, as Rosie accidentally stumbles upon a secret meeting with the chief of the Indian tribe, Michael Ames, and Darren's right-hand man, Jamie who is revealed to be the assailant who chased Rosie in the woods and beat her unconscious. After placing her body in the trunk of the car, Jamie goes to the woods to meet Michael Ames to discuss what to do with her. Michael, who is accompanied by Terry, refuses to play a part in Rosie's death and tries to walk out of the deal. Terry, fearing that her relationship with Michael will end and not knowing who is in the trunk of the car, silently walks over and places the car into drive, callously and unknowingly sending her own niece to a watery grave. 
Terry, who had been overcome with guilt all throughout the two seasons, tearfully confesses to the detectives and Rose's parents, accepting her part and willingly handing herself over. It's a truly heartbreaking and brutal resolution to the tragic murder. The family is devastated, and although Sarah and Holder are commended for their work by the police, both are left deeply affected by the case and everything that they've lost. Darren and his campaign, which manages to win the election despite all the controversy, begins pivoting in a newer, darker direction, and appears to freeze Gwen out of the picture entirely, now hardened by the Rosie Larson case. The season ends with our main duo delivering a video message that Rosie had left behind to her family, promising them that she loved them and would see them again someday. The pair then get a call from dispatch regarding a new murder to investigate, but Sarah declines after a moment of reflection, choosing to finally walk away from the career she has been so dedicated to. It's a powerful image and an excellent closer to both the season and the case. The season finale was reviewed mostly positive, while some were more critical, stating that it was overblown and not worth the buildup of two seasons. The ratings were pretty much even with the rest of the season, but well below that of the first series. Despite the small but rabid fan base that the show had gathered, it seemed that the damage was done, and AMC quietly cancelled the series a month later. But from the very beginning, the studio producing the series 21st Century Television made it abundantly clear that they intended to find the series a new home. DirecTV and Netflix were both brought up as possibilities, with DirecTV recently reviving the cancelled FX series Damages, and Netflix beginning to dip its toes into the original content pool for the first time. Amazingly enough, it would be AMC itself that would bring the show back, with assistance from Netflix in the deal that would surprise many. A third season of the show was greenlit with Enos and Kinnerman back in main roles in an entirely new supporting cast. Season 3 of The Killing aired in June 2013, right as the original For Pradelson was ending its third and final series. Both shows were trending topics on Twitter the night of the premiere, and many critics and fans that had abandoned the show in Season 2 had returned to see if a new case could breathe new life into the series. As it turned out it would, as the reception overall to the third season was that of an improvement over Season 2, and many had felt that the show had corrected the mistakes of the past. Namely, this time around, it was implicitly promised that the investigation would be solved by the end of the season. Venus Sood is nothing if not a cheeky mastermind. The new season begins over a year and a half after the Rosie Larson murder. Holder has done very well as a homicide detective, while Sarah has chosen a quieter life working at the ferry docks and enjoying her time with Jack and Reggie. At the same time, homeless teenagers of Seattle are beginning to go missing, and Holder comes across a case that bears eerie similarities to a case from Sarah's past. When Holder goes to Sarah with this information, it stirs up long dormant feelings of guilt in Sarah. Elsewhere, a death row inmate Ray Seward, played by the underrated Peter Skarsgård, is transferred to a new facility to await his execution. The prison guards react negatively to his arrival, and Ray seems determined to wreak as much havoc as he can while he's still alive. On the streets, runaway teen Bullet, played by newcomer Bex Taylor Klaus, begins frantically searching for her friend Callie Reeds. But Callie's mother, Danette, played by the incredible Amy Simetz, seems more interested in her own life than looking for her missing daughter. Meanwhile, after talking to Adrian, the little boy from Sarah's previous case, and Ray's father, and using his drawing, Sarah stumbles upon the bodies of 17 missing people in the retention pond revealing that a serial killer is prowling the streets of Seattle. This also suggests a connection to the murder of Adrian's mother and Ray Seward's innocence. The remainder of the season more or less follows the same formula as the first two seasons, with time being divided between the police task force assembled to find the serial killer, now being called the Pied Piper, the prison guards and inmates on death row, and the homeless teenagers of Seattle, all of whom could be potential victims. The 24-hour an episode that this two seasons previously established is no longer strictly adhered to, but still more or less covers the same amount of time as before. Of the new additions to the cast, Bex Taylor Klaus was a standout, as well as respected actors Greg Henry playing Holder's new partner Reddick, and Elias Codier as James Skinner, Sarah's old partner and lover, and now the new captain of the precinct. Klaus to me was originally a little off-putting, but their naturalistic performance made their plight and search for their missing friends all that more impotent. At the start, Sarah's personal connection to the case and Skinner put her at odds with the rest of the squad and Holder, but she remained steadfast not only solving the murders, but clearing Ray Seward's name as well. 
Sarah and Holder settle back into their partnership very quickly, and Bullet becomes a trusted informant in their window into the seedy underbelly of Seattle. Meanwhile, Ray's bravado at the prison creates more than a few enemies, and soon Ray begins buckling under the pressure of his looming death. More leads pile up, and as more victims are found, Danette Leeds begins to fear the worst for her daughter Callie. Amy's work here was my first exposure to her, and I've since become a big fan of hers. As previously stated, critics and fans were warmer to this season than Season 2, and the ratings for Season 3 remained on par with Season 2. The consistency and quality was maintained all throughout the season, with there being many standout episodes and moments. Jonathan Dim, noted director of The Silence of the Lambs, directed the ninth episode, Reckoning, in which Sarah and Holder discover that Bullet has unfortunately become the newest victim of the Pied Piper, a revelation that sends Holder into a deep depression. This episode was acclaimed by many critics, including some of the same critics that had previously written off the show. The same creative team behind the season 1 episode, Missing, delivered another standout episode this season, titled Six Minutes. In it, Ray Seward's execution date finally arrives, and Sarah desperately tries in vain to get him a stay of execution to save his life. Adrian arrives at the prison to see his father one last time, and Holder tries his best to keep his sanity in the wake of Bullet's murder. When the time comes, no one is there to save Ray, and he is unfortunately hung at the gallows, constructed specifically for him. It's a grim and intense hour of television, and one of the most acclaimed episodes of the series. The episode showcased some incredible acting from all three main actors, and none of this would have worked at all had it not been for the seeds planted all the way back in the pilot episode of the series. Venus Sued wasn't given the credit she deserved for crafting such a careful, meticulous narrative for the series that runs a tight thread over the course of the show's four seasons. The season three finale begins with Sarah and Holder arresting Danette's boyfriend Joe Mills for the Pied Piper killings after finding evidence connecting him to all the victims, even though Sarah herself still has doubts about his guilt. Upon discovering a new victim bearing the hallmarks of the Pied Piper, Sarah and Holder retrace Adrian and Ray's steps on the day of Adrian's mother's death, and Sarah comes to realize that Adrian had seen the Pied Piper dumping a victim in the retention pond, and thus had been the killer's actual intended target. Holder suspects Reddit, and Sarah rushes to save Adrian, who has gone missing in the wake of these discoveries. When Sarah goes to Skinner for assistance, he rebuffs her, but asks her to come along with him to his cabin retreat. Right as they leave, Sarah spots a ring belonging to Callie Reed's on Skinner's daughter's finger, revealing him to be the Pied Piper of Seattle. Skinner, knowing his cover is blown, blackmails Sarah into coming with him under the threat of killing Adrian. This turns out to be a ruse, as Adrian is found safe and sound by Holder, who then races off to find Sarah, having deduced that Skinner was the killer as well. Skinner brings Sarah to his lakeside cabin, which is revealed to hold even more victims. Skinner then goads Sarah into shooting him, not wanting to face the justice that awaits him. Holder arrives just in time and pleads for Sarah not to go through with it. However, Skinner's deep betrayal and cold admission of the countless murders proves to be Sarah's breaking point, and she shoots him point blank twice, silencing the Pied Piper once and for all. Holder begins to freak out while Sarah stares off blankly as the episode cuts to black. The finale was well received by critics who applauded the acting and direction, as well as the reveal of the killer's identity and the cliffhanger ending. Ratings were even with the second season finale, and Venus Sud and her team announced that they had plans for a fourth season. For once, everything seemed to be going right for the killing. Even though the ratings hadn't increased from the second season, delayed viewing boosted the show's viewership, and it was assumed, given the cliffhanger, that at least one more season would be forthcoming. AMC, however, was unimpressed with the show's improved third outing. And despite their newest shows failing to acquire an audience even the size of The Killings, and their flagship shows Mad Men and Breaking Bad ending their respective runs, the network decided to cancel the show yet again. Once again, however, word that the show would be moved to a new home spread fast, with Netflix in a prime position to order a fourth season due to the deal they had made with AMC for season 3. The Killing was a popular show on the streaming platform, and they were eager to expand their growing library of original content. And so, in late 2013, it was announced that the fourth season of The Killing would be a Netflix exclusive, marking the second time the show had been brought back from the dead. Move over with The Walking Dead, The Killing is AMC's true zombie series. Season 4 of The Killing debuted on Netflix in August 2014, with Enos and Kinnaman once again returning in their lead roles. 
Several returning cast members from previous seasons, including Amy Simetz and Billy Campbell, reprised their roles. Greg Henry was elevated to a main cast member, and prolific actress Joan Allen joined the cast as Colonel Margaret Rain, the head of an all-boys military academy. This time around, only six episodes were ordered by the streaming giant, with Vina Sood confirming that this would be the final season of the series, intending to wrap up all remaining loose ends. Although shorter than previous seasons, with the increased runtime of just under an hour per episode, the fourth season was able to cover a lot more ground than before. As the season begins, Holder and Sarah frantically begin covering up Sarah's murder of Skinner, submerging him in his car in the lake, along with several of his other victims. Sarah begins to deal with her own trauma of having fallen for the Pied Piper, while Holder begins to succumb to his guilt in covering up the murder. The two's carefully constructed partnership begins to buckle under this pressure, and the two barely have time to process things before they are thrust back into a new murder case, this time the mass murder of the Stansberry family. The sole survivor of the murders, Kyle Stansberry, is originally considered a prime suspect due to an apparent self-inflicted gun injury. Kyle, the black sheep of the family, had been attending the nearby military academy, and Colonel Rain takes it upon herself to protect Kyle from not only the police, but the vicious bullies that make up the school's student body. Holder later discovers that his girlfriend, District Attorney Carolyn Swift, and supporting cast member from Season 3, is pregnant with his child. This further drives a wedge between Holder and Sarah, who finds herself under the increasing suspicion of Reddick, who has been looking into Skinner's recent disappearance. The season continues to track Sarah and Holder's gradual spirals as they struggle to keep their dark secret under wraps. Meanwhile, Riddick begins to close in on the truth behind the Pied Piper killings and is just one step behind the detectives. Kyle and Colonel Rain begin to bond over mutual trauma as Margaret begins to reveal intimate details about her own past. Several suspects are interviewed and ruled out in typical killing fashion, only this time everything is moving at a lightning fast speed. Venus Sood's collection of screenwriters, directors, and actors come together one final time to deliver a truly epic collection of episodes and a worthy send-off to the series. Seeing Holder and Sarah at their absolute lowest and just barely hanging on to sanity was incredibly tough to watch, and more often than not I found myself wondering if either detective would make it out of the series alive. Sarah in particular unravels unlike ever before, even when her anchor, her son Jack, tries to reconnect her with her mother. The scenes between Sarah and Jack were particularly heartbreaking this season, as Sarah all but pushes everyone in her life, including Reggie, away. In fact, it's Jack himself who reunites Sarah with her long-lost mother, hoping to find someone to be in Sarah's life. In a quietly intense scene, Sarah and her mother, played by the iconic Frances Fisher, bring old wounds to the surface, and we finally get the payoff established all the way back in Season 2. Sarah seems to make peace with her mother and begins to accept her role in Skinner's murder. Eventually, Sarah makes one too many mistakes and the location of Skinner is discovered along with the bodies of several more victims. In another excellent callback to the series pilot, Skinner's submerged car is recovered from the lake as Sarah and Holder look on. Reddick, now sure of Sarah's guilt, relentlessly pursues her and Holder, but both refuse to turn on the other. Among the recovered bodies, the duo also recover Callie Leeds, allowing her mother, Danette, to finally have some closure. Meanwhile, Kyle begins to have flashbacks to the night of the murder, and the bullies that have been harassing Kyle all throughout the episode follow him all the way back to his house, where Kyle begins to break down. The students attempt to flee and pin the entire incident on Colonel Rain, who responds by killing them both to protect Kyle. Rain, who is revealed to be Kyle's biological mother, is taken into custody as Kyle, having endured a lifetime of abuse from his father and mother, finally remembers his role in the killings, and tearfully confesses to Sarah. In the series finale, deftly helmed by returning director Jonathan Demme, Sarah, unable to run away any longer, turns herself over to Reddick and the police. In a stunning twist of fate, Mayor Darren Richmond begrudgingly comes to Sarah's defense, covering up the truth of the Pied Piper's identity, much to Sarah's chagrin. Sarah, now defeated and unable to cope with letting another innocent man go behind bars, quits the police force one final time and leaves, having never implicated Holder in the murder. Five years later, Sarah returns to Seattle to make amends with Holder, both having left the police force and healed in the years since. Holder, now an AA counselor and sharing custody of his daughter with Caroline, asks Sarah to stay with him, but Sarah resists once again. In an excellent recreation of the series' opening credits, 
Sarah drives around Seattle before choosing to come back to Holder, the two now ready to embrace each other for a potential relationship. The fourth season of The Killing was well regarded by fans, but received a much harsher reception from critics than before. While many critics still praised the show's acting, direction, and atmosphere, many were critical of the writing, claiming it to be overdramatic and depressing. The coarser language and increased violence from the first three seasons was also negatively commented on. The closing moments of the finale were particularly criticized, claiming that the show had never set up a romantic relationship between the pair, completely ignoring their immense chemistry that had always been a hallmark of the show. Whether or not this relationship had been properly set up, I for one was happy to see the two leads happy and embracing each other after so many horrible, tragic events in their lives. That they were able to overcome their traumas and find each other again was poetic and a fitting end to the series. So while critics may not have agreed, I myself and fans have fully accepted the finale and are forever grateful to Netflix for giving this series the conclusion that it deserves. It's almost impossible for me to describe just how in love with the show I was. The Killing was one of the first television shows that I became obsessed with, and I counted my blessings every single day when the show was cancelled and then revived twice. So many shows don't get the second and third chances that The Killing did, and so I'll be forever grateful to Netflix and Venus Sud for believing in the show so ardently. Venus Sud in particular I feel bared most of the blame for the show's supposed shortcomings, which I obviously disagree with. Sood was the glue that held this entire show together, and I think her uncompromising vision just didn't sit well with critics, who oftentimes project their own desires and hopes onto a television series. It's a lot easier to criticize something than it is to actually make something, and what Venus Sood and her team managed to create in spite of the odds was something truly remarkable. The Killing was able to showcase some unbelievable acting talent while exposing underrated actors such as Enos, Forbes, and Kinnaman to a whole new audience. Kinnaman in particular has gone on to achieve great success in both television and film, and credits his role in The Killing for giving his career a much needed boost. Eno Sarsgaard, Venus Sud, and some other supporting players from the series all reunited this year for Blumhouse's The Lie, a flawed but engaging mystery thriller that bears all the hallmarks of an episode of The Killing. The series would also help bring back the serialized crime drama seen in shows such as Murder in the First, Top of the Lake, and The Bridge, itself an English adaptation of another Danish series of the same name. The music of The Killing I feel was incredibly special and important to creating the show's atmosphere. The composer of the original For Bedelsen series, Franz Bach, returned to compose the new score for the series, oftentimes reusing the same themes just composed in a new way. The show's use of background music was also incredibly effective. Several bands and artists that I now love, such as Nico Case and the Trailer Trash Tracys, all had their music featured in The Killing. Reception to the series has improved over the years and is now seen as a cult classic, with a small but dedicated fan base developing from watching the series on streaming. It seems that streaming was always the way to go for the series, as many fans binging the first two seasons shared almost none of the critiques about the writing of Red Herrings, having only been riveted by the central mystery. Perhaps if the series had been a Netflix exclusive from the very beginning, maybe things would have turned out differently. Venus Sud, however, maintains that the ending we got was the ending that she had always envisioned from the beginning of the series, and it's hard to argue with her given the careful plotting and storytelling that all expertly led to the conclusion. It wasn't the most consistent show, and had more than a couple of bumps in the road, but I'll never forget those many hours spent in front of the television just waiting to solve the mystery of who killed Rosie Larson. As I've grown up and experienced life as an adult, the show now hits even harder than it did before, and I can now fully appreciate the scope of what Venus Sud and her team set out to create. The Killing will always have a special place in my heart and memory, and one of the few shows that managed to create a special connection with me. As far as I'm concerned, The Killing set the gold standard for crime dramas, and it's a standard that very few shows could ever live up to.